and everyone for coming today. So we are going to tell you a bit about our project. Uh, this project was implemented in 2020 and 2021. The original idea uh, was Dr. Judith Denkingers uh, because uh, she had been working in Esmeraldas for a long time and um, more recently. So uh, later she went to work in Galapagos also for um, some years. When she came back to Esmeraldas, she saw the devastation of the coral reefs. And yeah, with that in mind, she applied to some funding uh, for this project and luckily she got the, the grant. So uh, we will focus today on telling you about plastics and coral reefs uh, in Esmeraldas. So as it happens around the world, uh, coral reefs are very sensitive uh, to different drivers of change, uh, like changes in water conditions and also human pressures. And in this case, the, the ghost nets are affecting these coral reefs uh, because this uh, fishing gear, not only nets, but mostly nets, they get lost for different reasons. And when they go to the bottom, they destroy the benthic communities that are feeding and giving shelter to other marine life. So, well, the, the question was, uh, how bad is this problem in this area? What is causing the problem? And uh, anyway, so the gate project was uh, organized in four components. The first one was uh, done by divers, both scientific divers and local divers who, um, uh, picked up the, the nets, they retrieved the nets and different gears that they found, uh, but also the scientific divers uh, made transects to characterize the benthic communities and be able to, to see the impacts of these nets on the uh, biological communities. The second component focused on, on the artisanal fishery, both to characterize the fleet, the catches, uh, some economic aspects, and also to, to understand the fishers perceptions about this uh, ghost fishing problem. What are the drivers? What is causing this problem? And so on. The third component was recycling of these nets through different approaches, depending on the materials and uh, uh, seeing, okay, what can we do with, this, with these materials? And the fourth component was about environmental education, both with adults, so to speak, with the communities, with fishers and other people living in these, in these areas. Also workshops with kids. And uh, we made a, a website and a lot of content with videos, with printable materials that can be found there. And this is still a project that we are working on. But today we are going to focus on the first two components to show you the, the results of these areas. So now Javi is going to continue the talk, right? Okay, thanks Gabi. Um, well, uh, I am going to talk about of the study area. It is called Bajos de Atacame. Uh, it is the place lo uh, located in the coast of the north of the Ecuador. Uh, for for me, well, uh, not for me, it's not for uh, for the human. <laughs> it is the important uh, place for ecological and biological aspect because in this place existed a continental reef ecosystem, very important for the fisher resources and and present um, the other animal that uses like like habitat, for, temporal habitat, for example, Humba well, Wells. Um, this is place uh, have uh, among five to meters depth. Um, in this place, there, there are to the important reefs, for example, the rocky reefs and coral reefs and the slowing crevices. This type of the reefs, uh, we concentrate during two years of the fieldwork activities to uh, do biological monitoring and, and retrieval of the ghost fishing net. On the other part, 
the project cons uh, uh, did uh, a social study, social study, a concentrate to describe what is the causes of the abandoned, lost, or discarded uh, fishing gear. Uh, specifically, uh, we work in the Tonchiwe, Sua, in Atacames. There are two the principal part of this of this part. A specific in the component of the biological monitoring and ghost girl retrieval, we combine some methods, for example, video transit to record coverage of the ghost fishing gear and fishes recording re records. Also, we use uh, the photographic sampling for venting organisms. And especially in ghost girl retrieval, we use uh, scuba diving and hookah diving. Uh, with the help of the local diver fishers. Uh, and here we, we had two steps, the first dive to a spot ghost fishing gear, and the second dive to retrieve ghost gear with assistance of the local and bio uh, biologist divers, like we can see in this picture. This is, a, this is a, in, the, in the world. Like preliminary, results about distribution and amount of the ghost fishing gear. Uh, I can say that this marine debris uh, was present in 21 of, of the 23 sampling sites that represent uh, 90%. Uh, also, we can found or observe uh, 125 items uh, of this uh, total, the items observed, we retrieved 63 nets uh, that represent uh, over 50% wing a weight of the 660 kilograms. Above of the material types of the ghost fishing gear, uh, we found two principal materials uh, more commonly. Uh, for example, monofilament net was the items uh, most observed over coral reefs, coral reefs, and this gear is associated uh, mainly with the gill nets. And on the other hand, we the multifilament net associated with the Purcise net uh, uh, mostly was observed over rocky reefs, rocky reefs. But we also, we find other materials, for example, monofilamental lines that provide of the hand or long line and multifilamental lines, for example, of the ropes, of the one component that compose of the gill nets. And finally, metal like anchors that we found more common in rocky reefs. Yeah. In, a, in addition, using the information through the biotransects, specific in ghost fishing gear coverage, we made of the multivariate uh, explorative, exploratory multivariate analysis, like canonic correspondences that uh, help to evaluate the relationship among the environmental variables, uh, ghost net coverage, and sample size. In this case, in this case, we found that the the, the highest uh, coverage of the ghost fishing gear were observed in place where there exists uh, a lot of uh, uh, sorry uh, where exists, for example, the hard coral substrate. See, in this in this place were most probable to define to the ghost fishes uh, coverage. Okay, about of the direct impacts and reefs, for example, we observe partial or total entanglement caused, uh, caused the smorting of the coral col colonies. Uh, how you can see in this left picture, we came to the, the coral reef patches cover total cover of the gill nets. And when the, we retrieve the one portion, for example, in one colony, we observe it 
of the the colonies, the over 80% of the, this colony uh, was dead. Also in, core, in Rocky Reefs, we found other interaction and other impacts. For example, uh, entanglement of the net fragments around the octocorals or subcoral. Um, in this case, it's very, uh, very, uh, very damaged because when the, the portion of the nest, or for example, the plastic uh, nylon, uh, we entangle in the skeletal structure of the octocoral is more propense to the get more disease, for example, for bacterial infection and other, and other kind of the disease. Well, uh, we we uh, have other indirect impacts. For example, we use information uh, collected in a SMEMAR project, the project carried out for Judith uh, for Judith Dinkinger in 2006, and compare wing information of the GhostNet project that carried out in in 2020 to 2021. And, and here we, for example, in this of the of the all fishing species observed in SMMR project, 20 fish species were not registered in 20 in 2020 and 2021. Mm -hmm. That is very pro, uh, preoccupant because despite largest sampling effort, we have to the, the field or preliminary evidence that it is probable to the loss of the, for example, the heart substrate, like the coral hearts, is probable when the damage that produced the nylon plastic is probable to the causes the some, some loss of the, the adequate day habitat for this is special, especially in the, for example, in three vulnerable species according to UCA. For example, Malacoctenus and Labrisonus are fish species have, have habitat, uh, have preference, for example, the, the cryptoventic uh, areas, specifically in the hard substrate like corals. If finally, uh, with the information of the sample of the ghost teaching where we, uh, we use the percentage of the coverage of the um, identification of the incrusting organisms like sponges, algae, um, uh, spurilis, like uh, uh, marine worms and the other subcolor that growing in the net we can estimate the approximately the age of the of the ghost fishing girl. And here we found of the, the most uh, nests were disposed in the soft floor, stayed for one to three years in the bajos de Atacamis. Okay, so after, so that was about the first component. And then for the second component uh, about the fisheries, we went to the landing sites, um, yeah. to the, the landing sites, both uh, during the day and during the night to um, ask the fishers about, so there were different studies. One was an interview that was done once with each fisher to understand the causes of, of the problem. And another sampling was uh, to record every fishing trip that we were able to, uh, to see where they were fishing and there is something in the chat. Okay. Um, where they were fishing, what fishes did they uh, fish that day, the amount and other aspects. So to be able to characterize the fishery and their catches. So uh, one aspect here is the spatial distribution of the different fishing gears. So in this area with muddy bottoms, uh, we have the trammel nets, of course, but these are made of cotton. And these are not so much involved in the ghost fishing problem. 
uh, here in this area. So these are these polygons are based on on the interviews that we made uh, of the different uh, trips that we recorded. And so on this area with the rocky reefs and coral reefs is where the monofilament gillnet is being used. And uh, outside the reef, uh, there are two type, types of long lines. One is used during the day and the other one during the night. And also for each fishing year, we know the main, the main target species, but there were many species for each year. So we made this, this collector's cure to show uh, how the richness, uh, so to speak, for each fishing year is growing in relation to our sample, our sampling program. So the more samples we add here, the more species that are recorded for each fishing year. But after a while, we add more samples and the number of species doesn't increase that much. And here we can compare. This is the trammel net. It gets a lot of species. Then the second uh, gear catching more species is the gill net. And then we have the two long lines that are more, more selective. And also for the, for the gill net, we have the highest number of samples. So we have a good, a good characterization for, for this fishing year. And here I want to show that after a while, as I say, uh, the species start to repeat and repeat and repeat. And so, for instance, we have this sort of assemblage that they are always together in the reef. This is also what my colleagues uh, saw uh, underwater. And this is what we found on the nets. And this is the main target species, the yellow, the yellow snapper. For this species and other targets, but we made uh, this uh, stock assessment uh, using length frequency data. With this, uh, for instance, we measure many, many fishes every month, every two months, and we get this uh, histogram of length frequencies. And if we combine uh, in a time series, we can estimate growth parameters and other population indicators or characterize the, the stock. And apart from that, we use um, information from the literature. And the idea is to get some indicators to see whether there is overfishing or not. And one of the results, at least for this species, is that uh, the exploitation rate is above the reference level of 0 0.5. So the, the logic behind this is that if we have a natural mortality uh, and a fisheries mortality. Uh, if natural mortality and fisheries mortality were equal, this number should be 0 0.5. So we are using or half the or half the, the fishes that are dying are being used for fisheries. But what we see is that more fishers are dying due to fisheries than due to natural causes. And this is already an indicator of overexploitation. I know there are many other indicators, but just to give you an idea of what we were able to do with this data. And we already have a slide. It's not the, the worst scenario, but it's already showing that the population is under pressure. Okay, and to conclude, to finish, uh, we have uh, another study, as I said, about the perceptions of fishers on this topic. And one of the questions was uh, to, to describe one event, event where the, the, the interviewee had lost he, his fishing gear and what was the cause of this, what happened and what type of fishing gear was it, how long, etc. And so we found that the, the first uh, cause was piracy uh, for 28% of cases. This means that, uh, well, we are uh, in a very uh, complicated zone due to traffic, illegal traffic of drugs. And these traffickers need these motors, these outboard motors for their, their activities. 
and they steal these motors from the fishers. So fishers are working and they see a boat coming. So they, are, they want to get away from there. And many times they will lose their nets and maybe they come back later, but they cannot find it or is already useless. And the second driver or the second factor is bottom obstructions, which is clear because they are fishing in, in rocky reefs or a reefs and the net can get entangled and break. And the third is interactions with marine mammals. As Javi said, uh, this is a feeding ground for humpback whales in a specific season of the year, and these are also interacting with the, with the nets. So uh, from, from all the reports that are included in this graph, this is the thesis by Annalise Povolo. She's here doing an interview. And 134 incidents are represented in that graph. And as she had the information about the materials and also prices of these materials, she was able to estimate that uh, around one half a million dollars was uh, lost in these incidents, only with the people that she could uh, ask. And only they were reporting one or two events that happened, but that doesn't mean this is all that they had lost. So you can see the, the economic consequences of this, of this problem too. So now to wrap up, uh, we have a high pressure of abandoned, lost or discarded fishing gear in the Bajos de Atacames area that we are working on. And this is caused by social and environmental drivers. Uh, the, indirect the direct impacts are mostly related to, to monofilament and multifilament materials, and they are affecting the coral reefs, right? And a lot of the, of the focus of our research is on the monofilament gill nets because Everyone knows this is not a good idea, but is uh, but is what is being used by the by the fishing community a lot, and this is already having a consequence on the resources and on the habitat for other species that are not maybe uh, economic resources. And piracy is this is very concerning, as you may have seen in the other video that we shared that this is having a a big impact not only on the on the people but also on the reefs is related to the gosnet project uh, gosnet issue and okay well this is what we can highlight from the study so far and thank you very much for your attention